It is Friday night. It is the second Friday of the month, which means it's a Samaka Place night. And uh, I'm here. Yay. Uh, Samaka Place, by the way, is having a little bit of a COVID issue. So we may be back there on the 21st or we may not. I'm waiting to hear. But um, we're not going to miss the second Friday. Tonight, I want to talk about something that, you know, kind of near and dear to my heart, a, more of a counseling session than it is a, a sermon. But I'm going to use uh, the biblical references, obviously, because that's what I do. I talk about the Bible. That's who I am. And we're going to talk about negative self-talk and self-sabotage. Uh, to my Restoration House guys, uh, I'm sorry if you're listening to this because I've kind of given you both sermons uh, at two different times. I'm going to kind of uh, bring them together and maybe go a little bit more in depth because I get a little bit more time here than I do at your place. So put up with me, especially you, James, the elder. I know you like to listen to me after I'm uh, uh, done and on YouTube. So uh, maybe this will be a refresher for you. So for those who haven't heard this, though, this is kind of a this is kind of important because uh, it really affects who we think we are and the world wants to tell you you're one thing you want to tell you you're a different thing and god wants to tell you really how he made you and who you are and how we think is very very important so i want to i want to get right to it uh if you go to proverbs 23 verse 7 i'm going to switch screens here real quick and read it to you it says as a man thinketh in his heart so he is that's the king james version as a man thinketh in his heart so he is now, that, that makes sense, right? You are what you think. We, we've heard that phrase before. If you've not heard that phrase before, um, congratulations, now you have. Uh, you are what you think. And so if you think you're going to have excellence, you perform at an excellent level. If you think that you are uh, uh, not performing well, then chances are you're not going to perform well. And so the, the, the mental capacity you have really determines um, how we perform in life and so when we are called by christ to have gifts and blessings and and serve and all those kind of things if you don't think you're good at it you just really won't be because of how you think now here's the here's the thing though i always ask folks this when i'm in front of them who do you who do you speak to the most in your life you know some of you say your spouse or your boss or whatever no it's you you speak to you the most we have an inner monologue and uh um, then the next question is this, is that inner monologue usually positive or is it negative? Most people, I've run into one or two, but most people say it's negative. I've run into one or two and say, is that really positive? And, and I'm like, wow, you guys got to talk to me because I've never met very many people that say that. Most people say that their inner monologue is negative. Uh, I should have said this to that person and they beat themselves up. You know, you ever have that thing where you have the perfect comeback the next day in the shower? Um, <laughs> it, we all have uh, this 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 negative monologue and the reason is this we have high expectations of ourselves right and it comes down to either we have high expectations of ourselves or other people have high expectations of us and we think they're legitimate and I'm not gonna say that they're not necessarily legitimate some of them are but when you don't meet your expectation when you fall short of an expectation what happens you start to think and you start to really bang on yourself, right? Now, some people are normal. Um, I don't think I'm one of them, but some people are normal, I guess. And their negative self-talk isn't too uh, aggressive or, or, or too overwhelming. There are those of us, like me, whose negative self-talk, honestly, is pretty brutal. Uh, I have extraordinarily high expectations of myself. And I get really frustrated when I feel I'm not meeting those expectations and I'm incompetent. It's a, it's a real pet peeve of mine. And the things I say to myself are um, not suitable for publication. <laughs> they are, they are um, really, uh, really harsh. I mean, I'll just be honest. They're really, really harsh. And, and, and I don't feel bad about it, honestly. I've always had that inner monologue. I've always done that. I've never really thought that was an issue. Uh, my wife thinks it's a big issue. And uh, I think God thinks it's a big issue. But I'm so ingrained in the habit. Are you like that? Are you so ingrained in the habit that even little things bother you? Big things, little things, everything kind of ah, you just get so agitated because you're you're so stupid or or you know you're just you're just such an idiot because you can couldn't remember things. I'll tell you a funny story. I told my I told my guys at Restoration House this. So uh, not last Tuesday, but the Tuesday before, I was going to uh, preach, and I was going to preach on negative self-talk of all things, and. I'm driving there and I realize as I look down, I'm wearing the wrong shoes. 
Now I, I gotta admit, I'm kind of I'm kind of a shoe whore. Uh, I love shoes. I got all sorts of shoes, and there's certain shoes I wear certain places. Now, the shoes I was wearing were the shoes I wear outside in the mud to take the dogs to do their you know whatever they're gonna do, run around. And these things are filthy. And I I did I told myself you got to change shoes, got to change shoes. Cause I brought the dogs out, come home, get ready to go, change shoes, go to Restoration House, go preach, right? And I'm in the car and I'm actually stopping at the store and I get out of the car and I look down and I'm wearing these idiot shoes. And I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm so stupid that I forgot to change my shoes. Who doesn't change their shoes, right? After I told myself, change your shoes, change your shoes. So I'm, I'm super embarrassed. I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking, well, do I need to go to the store and just buy another pair of shoes so I don't like look like a hobo here? Because these shoes are really nasty. And, uh, uh, and then I started laughing because I realized I'm just giving myself the business on this negative self-talk, which is exactly what I'm about to preach on. And so I fall into the same trap as everyone else. Now, there, there, I remember when I was in seminary, they said, you know, I really shouldn't preach on things that you have a problem with yourself. I'm like, Paul preached on things he had a problem with. I'm going to preach on things I have a problem with because, heck, you know, who, it takes one to know when you got to you got to be honest. You got to be authentic. And, and I'm here to tell you, I, I struggle a lot with negative self-talk. And I, I just I just think that that it really is a, a rampant thing because I know I'm not the only one. I know that most people have a, a negative opinion of themselves in one vein somewhere or another, right? And so it gets exas exasperated when you're not meeting your expectations. So that that's one way it happens. The other way it happens in negative self-talk is when you don't meet someone else's expectations. It could be a parent, it could be a spouse, it could be a coworker or a boss, um, it could be society, right? You know, it could be church, pastor is upset with you or whatever. Uh, other people have expectations of you. And when you don't meet those expectations, you feel bad about yourself and you give yourself a hard time. I'll give you an example right now. Uh, uh, Tanya, who does our filming for our, our Sunday morning worship online, we do this, this thing on Thursdays. We film the, the, the pastor doing the whole service. I do the editing. We put it up. Well, the other day, uh, we were Thursday. That was yesterday. Uh, she was working with camera A and camera B and we're getting them all set up and she wanted to get this really cool artsy shot. And so she put the pastor off to the left and she had the cross and it was lit up. It's just beautiful. And it looked, looked good from us. You know, when we're looking at the camera, it looked fine. Well, what happened was the camera focused on the cross and the pastor ended up a little blurred, right? Not, I mean, not blurry, blurry, but a little blurred where you can tell. And so, um, as I'm editing, I'm like, God. I, is my eyes going bad? Is my computer screen just not right? Because I, I could tell. And when I, I sent it to her, oh, she just felt awful. She felt horrible. She couldn't believe she did it. And she just, I, I know what's going through her head. You know, she just felt like she was not competent and, and really screwed it up. Well, it's not a big deal. It's it's the Sunday morning worship online. We've been doing it for since the beginning of COVID. So 20 months almost, right? 19 months, whatever it's been. And it's one one weekend, and I was able to clean it up some. So it, it was not a crisis. It was it was just one of those things that happens. But I know how she feels because she was really dogging herself about it, negative self talk, and tearing herself down. And so you know it happens in the in in because she had an expectation that she would do a great job, which she always does. And I'm sure when she knew the pastor was going to look at her pastor, uh, he he he's not a well he's a little bit of a perfectionist, but but he he likes things a certain way. And I and you know that as soon as he saw it, he was going to see that that was a little blurred and the focus was on the cross and not particularly on him speaking. And that was going to be um, something he would notice. And so she was like, oh, you know, I'm not meeting his expectation. See, it, it, it comes from both ends, not just our own expectations, but but someone else's expectations on us when we don't meet it. We feel bad. And and it, it, I think it's okay to feel bad. I think it's okay when you don't meet your expectations, say, oh, you know, dang it, I didn't make my expectation. But it's another thing to really dog yourself. And, and uh uh, I want to talk about where that comes from and why it's important. So I'm going to go back to that scripture. If I remember uh, Proverbs 23, 7, how a man thinks is how he is. You know, you are what you think. If you think of yourself in negative terms, if all you're doing in your inner monologue is saying how many times you blew it, what you didn't do right, dogging yourself left and right, how are you? Are you, are you well emotionally? Are you well mentally? Are you well spiritually? Is that is that how you are? Or are you broken? And and this is where the where where the crux of this whole thing of negative self-talk is. 
um, we're broken. Now, I'm the first to admit, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm busted. I'm, I'm broken. And that's why it happens. And my wife will tell me, you know, the things that you say to yourself, the things that when you were abused kid, people said to you, it's like, okay, yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean my expectations are wrong. So I don't want to, I don't want to mix the, the, the message here. I think having expectations of excellence is, is important. I think you want to strive for excellence. I think you want to do a great job. I think you want to be competent. I just think that when you're not, when you miss the mark, because we all do, right? Even if, even if you're uh, going to go this route and say, oh, I'm a sinner, so I'm not going to do it all perfect all the time, you're going to miss the mark, and it's okay to miss the mark every once in a while. Now, you get better, you learn from it, you don't just accept mediocrity. Uh, that, that drives me crazy. You, everyone's got this, this ceiling of potential. You should be striving for it every time. I, I tell my karate students in my karate dojo, I have this, the rules, and the rules say, one of the, the, the top rule is every day you give 100% of what you have. The expectation is, I don't care how you feel, I don't care what's going on in your life, every day you give 100% of what you have. Now, each day looks different, doesn't it? Some days you have a lot, and you're just like, woo. Other days, you don't have so much, but you give 100% of what you got. And, and then you can feel good about everything. Where we get in trouble is, we don't believe we're giving 100%, right? So if I wear the wrong shoes, I think I didn't give 100% there. I wasn't paying attention. I was being stupid. I was distracted. I, I, I have a short-term memory issue because I'm getting older, uh, which is not acceptable. I'm, I'm, I'm fighting this old age thing. I'm going down swinging. Um, and, and we get fired up about things. Now we get fired up about small things. We get fired up about big things. Um, I made, I've made big mistakes. I'll tell you the biggest mistake I made. Uh, and this one, I, I offered my resignation at a job because of this one. We had a memorial for veterans, uh, who had been KIA killed in action. And what we had put was their, their service branch name well, and rank and all those kind of things. And I got the, I, I had like a bunch of people going on a wall and I got one of the service members um, branch wrong. He was, he was Marine, not Army. And we were doing an unveiling for the widow the day before and it was wrong. <laughs> it was in granite. It's like, oh my gosh. And I realized as soon as they pulled that thing, the, the, the drape off the thing, I'm like, oh no, I think I screwed this up. And the look in the widow's face, I was just, I was devastated by it. I was like, that was like the worst mistake I've made in my life. And I've made good ones. I've made good mistakes, especially when I was in journalism and the misspellings of headlines. And I put the wrong picture with a dead guy once in a little bit. Um, but this one was bad. And I immediately went to the office and I went to the director of the agency and, and tendered my resignation. I thought it was that bad. And he wouldn't accept it. But I was willing to fall on my sword on that one because it was bad. And I beat myself up on that forever and ever and ever because, you know, I hurt somebody's feelings. And that, that wasn't a good thing. Because I, and, and why? Because I was too busy. I wasn't paying attention. I uh, rushed the, the job, right? And I rushed the, the research. It was just dumb on my part. And, and you know, I, I really gave myself uh, no quarter uh, on, on that kind of thing. Now, honestly, I believe that that was the right thing to do because you can't screw something like that up. There, I mean, there's a zero tolerance on those kind of things. Um, but the things I said to myself were, yeah, horrible. And I wouldn't say that to anybody else. I wouldn't tell anybody the thing I tell me. Uh, my wife was funny that day. She goes, yeah, sometimes you say that you treat me like you treat you. She goes, I don't want to be treated like you treat you. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of laugh. I'm like, oh, okay. Because um, I, you know, it's funny when you have negative self-talk. You don't think you're treating yourself badly. You think you're treating yourself the way you should be treated. And that's why it's so hard to break out of the negative talking, the negative pattern, is because you think that's the way it should be. That's normal. That's, that's, doesn't everybody do this? Um, and to some degree, I think we do, but not to the degree that some of us do. And how negative self-talk affects us then is if we really think we're stupid or being an idiot or incompetent or not worth anything, you know, worthless, don't have any self-worth, people will never love us, people will never care about us, whatever it might be, right? People will never get you, uh, people will never be able to empathize with you, people will never understand you. That's how you are, scripture says. And then you, be you become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is the hard part I, I struggle with is how not to become a self-fulfilling prophecy because my brain tells me all these negative things. And what happens then is you go make that happen. I mean, because how you think is how you are, right? 
And so um, you got to be really careful with expectations. And this is some, someone was asking me, well, how do you how do you deal with negative self talk? Well, you adjust your expectations, and I think that's really brutal to do. Uh, for me, like I've had these expectations myself for. Let's see, I'm 57. I probably started them when I was five, so 52 years. I, I can think back all the way to being five years old and some expectations I had that I still have. And, um, and and you grow up and you have behavioral development and you believe these things, right? And so how do you how do you temper your expectations in such a way where you can temper the negative self-talk, right? So if you miss the mark, it's not a crisis in your life or a... Uh, reversion back to uh, what a fool you are for not being able to accomplish it. So here's what I told I told my guys on on uh, my Tuesday night preaching. I said y you have high expectations. You don't change the expectation, but you stair step to those expectations. So first you got to do it, first thing you have to do is say, is my expectation realistic? Right? Uh, am I what I'm? What, is what I'm expecting of myself? Is that something that is realistic? Can I actually accomplish that? Because a lot of times expectations um, are wish lists, wish lists, but they're not truly expectations that are that are attainable. Uh, I wish I could do that, or I perceive I should be able to do that, but you can't. Right? It's not that you don't want to. It's not that you don't think you should. You just don't have the ability. And so you got to be really honest. Scripture says, have a sober judgment of yourself. And I think this is an area where uh, some people I meet, uh, and maybe me included, but I'm not willing to go there quite yet, uh, don't have a sober judgment about just what they can and can't do. And I think you got to get to a place uh, where you have, now it's funny with people say, you know, Tom, you're, you're so good at what you do. I'm good at what I do. I'm not good at anything I don't do because I have a sober judgment. There's things I don't do. And uh, I hire people to do those things because I suck at them. Anything having to do with building stuff. That's just, you want demo, I'm your guy. You want to build something and make it look right, I am not your guy. I, I, I will try, but it will look like crap. Um, I don't have skills in that. And, and so I don't do it, so I don't fail, right? Because I know my expectation would be, I, I just don't have the skill set. So I have a real sober judgment about what I'm capable of and what I'm not capable of. And every once in a while, I'll screw up. Like I, I had this uh, pad I had to put out back and uh, it, it seemed like a simple job. You, you get the land ready, you put these little uh, stone things down, you, you measure them up, put some dirt on it. Woohoo, you got, you got a pad. Not even close to even, not even close to how it worked. The ground was uneven. I couldn't even the ground up. I couldn't make a rest. So frustrated. And meanwhile, my wife's calling somebody professional saying, my husband's screwing us all up. Can you can you come out here and fix this for me? Um, and they did a great job. And I was happy to pay the guy because there was no way in, in the world that even though I thought I should be able to do that, there's no way I could do it. And so you got to have a sober judgment. And so if you have a sober judgment about what you can do and what you can't do, that's the first step in making sure your expectation's realistic, right? So that's, that's the first step. If you're having negative self-talk and you're finding yourself constantly in the grind of negatively attacking yourself because you're not meeting a certain expectation, you really got to think if that's a reasonable expectation. Uh, now, okay, let's say you've done that and you say, okay, these are my reasonable expectations. The next thing you do is you stair step to them. Sometimes you can't eat the whole apple at once. Sometimes you got to take a bite at a time. And so you benchmark your way to meeting the expectation. Um, I give you example. So I learned, well, I kind of learned Russian when I was in the army and then in college. And uh, uh, I was not a good linguist. They, they give you this test when you join the military to find out if you know anything about languages. And I swear to goodness on the Scantron, I was making a Christmas tree. I had no idea what was going on. They said, oh, you're so good at this. You can take a level five language, which was Russian, Chinese, Arabic, uh, man, yeah, yeah, Mandarin, Chinese. And um, uh, it was crazy. I was like, okay. So they put, put me in Russian, which is a really hard language. Uh, and I, I, I was marginal at best, I think, marginal at best. And then when I was in Lang when I went to college after the army to finish my Russian degree, they bumped me from second year. They didn't get me take third year. They bumped me to fourth year, and I just swam. Man, I just couldn't couldn't do that. But my expectation was I should be able to do this. It's just words. It's just language. I should know this. And I was getting very frustrated because I was not good at it, and I was not natural at it. And languages, I remember I took six years of German, and it didn't come easy at all. Uh, languages just are, are very difficult for me for some reason. 
but I thought I should be able to pull it off, right? I thought I should do this. And, and that was a bad expectation. <laughs> I shouldn't have had that expectation. I should have the expectation that I'm very marginal at this. Same with music. I, I love playing music. I, I was going to minor in trumpet performance in college. Um, but I'm not a good musician. I'm, I, I have to work at it. It's, it's not, it doesn't come easy. I'm, I'm a right brain thinker, which means I'm logic, I'm, I'm reason. Uh, I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, one of those analytical guys. I have some left brain stuff, but not enough to make me good at it. And so I have to have reasonable expectations. And so I've had to lower them in, in, as I've gotten older and realized this, I gotta lower those expectations a little bit because it's not realistic for me to say, I'm going to be a great musician or I'm going to be a great linguist. Just not going to happen. That's just the wrong expectation. Now, does that mean that I can't be a good linguist or a good musician? No, but I got to work at it and I got to stair step my benchmarks to get to a place where I feel competent, right? So that's how you do it. You say, okay, if I want to reach this level and this is my expectation, what I've got to do is I've got to hit this step first and then I'm going to hit this step and then I'm going to hit this step. You make a plan. To, to reach a level of competency. But just because you're not competent today or you're not reaching the expectation today doesn't mean you're a failure unless you don't build those stair steps in. Because if you think that just because, you know, just because I played trumpet in college and, and at one point wasn't too bad of a player, uh, that I could pick it up today, 35 years later and do okay, that's, that's dumb. That's, that's, not, that's not even, I don't know who could think that way. Um, I'm not even sure I could read music anymore. I have to really, really put myself to the test on that, right? But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to try. Because matter of fact, I, I'm getting myself a new flugelhorn to kind of force myself to start playing again because I really miss playing music, um, even though I'm no good at it anymore. But I think I couldn't be better at it. I think I can actually be competent at a certain level. Certainly not where I was when I was playing in the number one jazz band at the University of Oregon uh, my sophomore year in college. I'm never going to be that guy anymore. But I am going to be a guy that can maybe play at church and not embarrass myself. How about that? How about that expectation? Do you think I could pull that off? I think I can pull that off. But I'm going to stair step that one because I can't do it today. <laughs> so that's what I mean. So that way, when, I'm, I, when I first pull my horn out and I start to practice, I don't have to get mad at myself that I can't hear middle C or I can't play a scale in, in three octaves or whatever, whatever it is I'm trying to do. I can stair step these things. And what that does is it makes you uh, have an expectation that's realistic, attainable, and a plan. And that way you're not giving yourself the business when you're not automatically meeting the expectation because you're meeting the stair steps of the expectation. Now, that all makes sense because I, I really think that the negative self-talk really comes from not meeting our own expectations. And so, you know, if you're going to do the, if you're going to do the work on this, if you have real bad negative self-talk, you've got to go through the list of things that cause your self-talk. What are the expectations you have that, are causing you to give yourself such a hard time. Give me an example. Uh, I'm full of examples tonight, aren't I? Uh, when I teach at Corbin University, I never really give myself a hard time because uh, I don't have huge expectations of myself in terms of uh, the, the teaching method and, and having to be the great professor that does these great lectures and that kind of stuff. My expectation is I connect with the students in my class and I give them real life experiential education. And we read the book at the same time, right? So I kind of think of a different approach to, to education. Uh, and I have very little pressure on me. And it seems like every, every Tuesday and Thursday when I'm teaching, I meet my expectation because it's certainly not very high in terms of that. And I don't have any pressure. And I don't feel any negative self-talk about it. I don't come out of a class going, gosh, I should have done X, Y, or Z, or I should have said this, or I should have done that. And, and I, don't, I don't ever feel that way. I feel like, hey, that was a great, fun class. That was a great being with those kids for an hour and a half. So that's how you have a good expectation. Bad expectation in my life, um, I hate incompetency. And I have an idea of what incompetency looks like in my life. Uh, not being able to do the simple things I can do. Now, what sucks is as you get older, you start not being able to do those things. You start not being able to remember where you put stuff or, or can't remember to change your shoes or you can't remember, you know, your calendar events and those kind of things. And you're just, you know, you know just ripping yourself over those things. And it's really, you know, you have to, you have to adjust fire as you get older. 
uh because your brain doesn't work the same you, know, you go through these these phases I, I was reading somewhere the other day that that someone talked about the five phases of life and i'm i don't know which one i'm in but it's not the good one um you get the like this the baby one and then you got adolescence and then you get young adult and young adults where you want to be stay there if you can uh and then you get to me which is like middle age moving towards senility <laughs> it's just not so great and so you have to change your expectations too as you get older uh physically for example when i go uh teach karate or if i'm going to do my dojo stuff last night i was having a hard time i was just not balanced and throw my kicks right well one of the things that happens when you get older is your balance goes a little bit and i'm finding that when i'm throwing the kicks that i've thrown tens of thousands of times over 39 years my balance is off i'm throwing my head back i'm turning my shoulder i'm not doing what i'm supposed to do and it's driving me crazy because i've done this over and over and over and over and over and it should just happen and all of a sudden i'm having a, a little bit of an issue and i have to adjust fire and that kind of stuff drives me crazy because for me that's not competent and I've been doing this for so long, it should look the same every single time I do it. And here's another fun one. So, so I've shrunk. I, I, I'm, I used to be six foot two, and I'm now six foot and a half inch. And so I was, I was trying to do this technique on a guy, and I kept missing the technique. And I realized I was an inch and a half off of being able to be, have my leg long enough to catch the guy where I wanted to. And I'm like, I can't believe this. I've shrunk, and now I'm throwing the thing the exactly the same way, and I can't make the technique work because I'm too short. And my brain thinks I'm 6'2", but I'm not. I'm six foot plus half an inch. So I got to adjust fire my expectation. Do you see how that works? But unless you know that, it'll drive you crazy. It will drive you bonkers uh, that you're not doing what you're supposed to do, or at least what you think you're supposed to do. And so you really got to have a sober judgment about what is the right expectation? What, you know, do I need to adjust fire on it? And if so, what would be realistic? And then how do I stair step to it so I'm not just thinking I should be automatically meeting that expectation? Now, there are things that you should just be meeting those expectations, right? I'm not going to say there's not. There's things in marriage where you should meet those expectations. There's things at work. You better work hard. You better perform, right? And you're not going to have a job. Um, there, there are places where you need to, you need to you know, meet those expectations. But don't set yourself up to fail by putting yourself in a position where there's an expectation that you can't meet. I mean that that's just setting yourself up to fail so don't do that that that's a dumb thing to do and and so there's ways where you can actually run your life in such a way where you can minimize or at least manage the expectations to such a degree where the negative self-talk dies down and it's not a constant voice in your head telling telling you that you're not right the last part of this before i switch over to why it's important in terms of how it deals with self-sabotage is this satan can't read your mind okay let, let let me let me demystify some of this stuff that maybe you've seen on the tv or in the movies satan is a created being he's an angel he's made a little higher than us but he is not god he is not omniscient he doesn't know everything he's not omnipresent he's not ever at once and he certainly is not omnipotent which is all powerful he's a created being now they watch you all the time and they're taking notes and all that but they can't read your mind you know, the demons and Satan, they can't read your mind, but they hear you. And so for me, <laughs> when I'm fired up about something, I have a consistency of what I get fired up about. I am sure that there is a demon watching me. And when I'm frustrated and I say how stupid I am, right, either under my breath or out loud, and when Lisa's not here, fairly loud, um, that, that demon's going, yeah, you are stupid, Tom. Gosh, anybody can do that. And that's where the spiritual warfare comes in, right? It amplifies the negative self-talk that comes from you and amplifies it by saying, you're right. How can God love you? You're, what a sinner you are. What, how, what, who do you think you are, right? That's that little voice. Not because he's reading your mind, because he's watching you. And this is the danger of having a lot of negative self-talk is it can lead to a very uh, aggressive, spiritual warfare attack that tries to amplify the negative voice and pull you away from relationship with God. Now, do you really think that can happen? Yeah. I'm looking at this sheet over here. Uh, I've got it on my screen. Uh, who are you in Christ? Are you that fool? Are you that incompetent person? Are you that? No. 
That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says you're a child of God. Scripture says you're a friend of Christ. Scripture says that you're not guilty. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. Scripture says that, that, that you belong to God. No one can snatch you from Jesus' hand, right? Um, you have direct access to God. Scripture says that you are free from any kind of condemnation, including whatever Satan says about you, including whatever you say about you. You're free from all that. Uh, that that you are sanctified, you're set apart, you're, 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 you're considered holy and righteous in God's eyes through the blood of Christ. You know, you're a citizen of heaven already, right? Scripture says all these things. You're the light of the world. Uh, you're, you're, you're a branch of the true vine, right? You're abiding in Christ. He's abiding in you. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. All, I mean, there's there's all these things the Scripture says that that we as followers of Christ are. That is the antithesis of anything negative we're saying about ourselves. Now, some of you are out there going, well, Scripture says all fall short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, not one. What are you saying, Tom? I'm saying that that's why we need Jesus. But the moment you accept Jesus, that's why Scripture says you need to be born again of the Spirit. And when you're born again, you become a new creation of Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. All right? You are transformed. You're not that anymore. You're not dead in your sins. You're not going to spiritually die. You're spiritually alive with Christ. Now, that doesn't mean we don't struggle in this life. You know, we have this, this sin nature thing that drives us crazy. Uh, but we have to understand we, what we need to embrace is that we're forgiven and we have grace and there's mercy. And, and all of these things that Christ has done for us, we have to embrace that and live that life. Because you can't have love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, the spiritual fruit. Now, notice I said nine things, but it's spiritual fruit. It's one thing. You can't have that unless you believe you are who God says you are. So how you think is who you are. Okay? And it, it matters. It matters a lot. Because what will happen is, I said this a little earlier, you will become a self uh, uh, a self-accomplished uh, pro prophecy. You will, you will make it happen. Whatever it is you're thinking. And so, um, I'll give you an example. Another example. I'm full of examples again tonight. In, in my with my karate students last night, I got I had a, a big group and and I got done and I had them circled up and I said, look, I want you to do mental reps. And so during the week before I see you again on Saturday, I want you to think through what a round kick looks like, what a side kick looks like, what a front kick looks like, hook kick, jab, cross, uppercut, you know, all, all the hooks, all the punches, back fist, spinning back fist, all the stuff. I mean, I want you to visualize it because how you think is who you are. And if you can visualize what you're supposed to do, it's amazing when you come back a couple days later how much better your technique looks because the mental reps matter. So if your mental reps in your head are negative. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I can't get it right. No one loves me. I, or I'm unlovable. Or I keep screwing up. Or whatever it is. You will keep screwing up. You will be unlovable. You will be all those things. Because the mental reps that you're doing is a self-fulfilled prophecy. By the way, that's the word I was looking for earlier and couldn't find. If, however, you say, I'm a child of God and I am forgiven and I can dust myself off every day because God's mercies are new every morning and I am not under condemnation, and I can go directly to the throne and be before God, and I can seek forgiveness if I screw up, I can ask for wisdom, I can have the spiritual fruit, I can have blessings, I can do all these things through Christ, I can do all things through Christ who, who, who strengthens me, right? I can take every thought to the obedience of Christ, which means everything that happens, I'm thinking, how would Christ want me to deal with this, right? I can do all that because Scripture says I can. And I'm, I'm not only just given permission, I'm given authority to do that. And if that's what my monologue is saying, if that's what my mental reps are saying, how does that change the game for you? It, it, it fundamentally changes what we're doing. And, and so I think it's important that, that we understand that when Proverbs says how a man thinks is who he is, that your negative self-talk is creating a you that is not of God. That's of your, that's of your human nature. That's of your sin nature. And it's a it's a thought process that will get you in deep trouble, not only because there's spiritual warfare, but because of this next part. I'm going to talk about um, what's called self-sabotage. So self-sabotage is when 
you, I'm kind of getting my notes ready here, if you don't mind. Um, it, it, it's really when you think about, there's something you want, but for some reason, in your past behaviorally or because your negative self self talk or whatever it is, you make sure that you don't get it because you don't really believe you deserve it or you don't really think you're worthy of it or whatever it might be. And so I'm gonna give you some biblical examples of negative self talk leading to self sabotage and show you how this worked out. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna go through um, an A through J, however many numbers that is, and I'm gonna show you some Bible characters and how they sabotage themselves because each one did it differently. And then I'm gonna go through the, the, the details of how they did it again. And I want you to pay attention here. I want you to note how many times you've done this to yourself, okay? So maybe you wanna take a note here, uh, grab a pen and paper, um, because this is, this is uh, uh, really important for your life because it could be, it could be, it could be earth shattering. It could be the Holy Spirit's going to give you an epiphany right now. Who knows what's going to happen? So here we go. Uh, the first people in the Bible that, that had a self-sabotage was Adam and Eve, wasn't it? Right? Adam and Eve. They were told to do one thing. You can do anything you want. Just don't touch that stupid tree. All right? That's all they had to do. And Eve even got it right when she first started talking to the snake. You know, we're not supposed to touch that tree because if we do, we'll die. And the snake says, well, surely you're not going to die. You're, what's going to happen is your eyes are going to be open. You'll be like God. Right? At that moment, it's not that Eve, it says Eve was deceived, but she didn't know, She did, it's not like she didn't know right from wrong. She knew right from wrong. And she chose wrong. Because she says, well, you know, being like God's probably a good thing. Not understanding that you can't be like God. And if you desire to be God, like Satan wanted to be God, you, you, bad consequences. And what's fascinating about it, it says Eve, Eve was deceived and, and Adam sinned because if she takes the bite of this, of this fruit, turns to Adam and says, here, this is good for eating. And what did he do? Did he knock it out of her hand before she took the bite? Did, she, did he rebuke the snake? Did, did, did he grab her and whisk her away and save her, which was his job? Well, he sat there and went, well, that was pretty good. So he failed because he was the spiritual leader and he was supposed to protect Eve from evil and make sure that she abided by the rules. And instead, he fell. Okay? Now, how did they self-sabotage? They didn't do what they were told to do. They disobeyed the rules. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever disobeyed the rules? What were the consequences? You knew the rules. You self-sabotage. Adam and Eve did. Now let's talk about the Israelites. They're wandering in the desert, right? Here, what is the trip from from uh, uh, from Egypt to the Promised Land? Was something like I don't know, eleven days. It wasn't supposed to take very long. And what do they what do they do? They get to the Promised Land. They send in the spies. They come back, and Joshua and uh, Caleb say, it's great. God's with us. Let's go get him. And all the other ones went, oh my gosh, they're giants. We can't take them because they didn't believe or trust God. And because they didn't trust God and they trusted in their own emotions and made an emotional decision out of fear, they wound up wandering in the desert for 40 years. And that generation died out without getting to the promised land. Okay. Now, let's talk about Moses. Moses lost the promised land. He didn't get to go in. So there's a scene early on where, where the people are whining about water. They want water, and, and, and God says, look, Moses, take your stick, hit the rock, water will come out. Water came out, happy, happy. Well, a little later, they want water again, and God tells Moses, speak to the rock. And Moses is upset. He's, he's, these people have really pushed him to the limit. And if you know the story, you can, you can see why. But we also know that Moses has an anger issue. He's already killed an Egyptian because of his anger, and he's, he's had flare-ups and outbursts. And he says that, uh, he's talking about Aaron and him, should we give you water? And he smacks that rock and water comes out. Well, he disobeyed God because he decided he would be in charge. He said, should we give water? It's not that God's giving water, it's he's doing it. And it was his arrogance, it was his pride. And, and 
he self-sabotaged his opportunity to go to the promised land because he knew what he was supposed to do and let his emotions get the better of him. He let his anger get the better of him. He let his pride get the better of him. So then we, we fast forward to, that, to the Israelites again because they're knuckleheads. They want a king like all the other nations at one point, right? And God says, well, I'm your king. And they said, no, no, we want, we want a king like all the other nations. And God says, okay, but, you know, suffer the consequences. And certainly they do, because if the king did well, they did well. And if the king didn't do well, the people suffered. And the people were eventually dispersed into, into captivity and, uh, you know, lost the promised land because of that. Uh, up until after World War II, when uh, the, the European Jews came back and were, were placed back in Palestine and got, and got part of the Jerusalem back and all that. So what happened to the Israelites in this case? They wanted to be like everyone else. They didn't want to be sanctified as God's people. They wanted to be like everyone else. They want to be like the culture, right? Saul is the first king of Israel. So they get this king and Saul's the first one. <laughs> he wants to go, I think he's going to war and he's, he's, he's waiting for Samuel, who's the big prophet. Samuel's kind of the leader. He's the guy, he's the go between, between God and, and, and the king. And, and, uh, uh, they're waiting for Samuel to come and give a prayer. Well, Saul's impatient and says, well, I'll, I'll just do this prayer. And Samuel shows up and says, what are you doing? God's blessings off you now because you, you overstepped. He got out of his lane. He did what he wasn't supposed to do because it wasn't his to do. And because of that, he self-sabotaged his entire kingship. And we all know what happens af afterwards. He and his, his son, Jonathan, ended up dying in a battle. Actually, they, they fall on their swords, which is um, rather than be captured. Samuel self-sabotaged himself. David lost building the temple because there was too much blood on his hands, right? Now, think about David as a young, young boy. He's fighting Goliath. He's, he's God's champion. Samuel comes and anoints him with oil, saying, you're going to be the king. Do you think that you would just shut up and wait your turn and, you know, trust God's promise? No, the guy had a lot of blood on his hands. He kills his best friend Uriah. He rapes Bathsheba, um, steals his Uriah's wife there and, and makes her his wife. Um, I mean, just not a good guy. And God just says, no, you're, you're a man of my own heart because you always come and confess, but there are consequences for your actions because uh, you are leading too much of a hedonistic lifestyle. Even though you confess a lot, which is great, um, you're not going to get a blessing from me out of it. So Solomon, his son, gets to build a temple, which is great, right? But he writes a book called Ecclesiastes, and the entire book says, I've tried everything under the sun, and I realize that nothing matters but the fear of the Lord. He wasted his entire life, he says in this book. He was the wisest person ever to live. Every king and queen from all over came and sought his counsel. But he couldn't take his own advice because he did everything God told him not to do. And at the end of his life, he writes this book saying, I was a knucklehead and I lost everything because of it. I'm glad he came to the conclusion, obviously, but he self-sabotaged himself because he knew exactly what he was supposed to do. His son, Rehoboam, is a real knucklehead because he, he inherits the kingdom, right? Solomon's built the temple and he dies and Rehoboam is gonna become king. And the elders come to him and say, you know, Solomon built cities, he built monuments, he built the temple, he's taxed us like crazy. If you were to come in as king and lower the tax rate, the people would rejoice and you would have a blessed kingdom. And Rehoboam, instead of listening to the elders, went to his friends, kind of hooligan friends, and they said, no, nah, let, let's raise the taxes even more. So he comes back and says, we're going to raise taxes even more. And the kingdom splits. They're saying, we're not going to, 10, 10 of the, the tribes leave and said, we're not supporting you. And he ends up being the king of Judah and not for long. And the kingdom was then split for, uh, until, in, well, until the exiles. All because Rehoboam, he sabotaged himself. He didn't listen to wise counsel. Two more, I swear. Ananias and his wife Sapphira in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it says every, this is Acts, Everyone came and gave what they had for the common good, right? So people had stuff, were, were either selling and, and giving to the good and helping the widows and the orphans, and everyone had and could. Well, these two people, married couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they have property, and they're going to sell it and give it to the common good. But as they sell it, they go, hmm, you know what? 
why don't we keep a portion of it and we'll just tell them that's that that it's all of it so they lied and they lied to the holy spirit and they get they get smoked they're the only people in the, in the new testament that god comes out and goes whack <laughs> smotes them and, and the lesson is why are you lying they self-sabotage themselves because they could have kept the money all they had to do is tell the truth and say no we're going to keep 15 percent back for us they didn't do that they lied and and what did they get they get smoked right and and there was no reason for it nothing and then the last one is our favorite guy judas judas uh you know was with jesus for three years sees every miracle see he believes he's the messiah but he believes he's the conquering hero messiah see in the jewish culture at the time they believed in two different messiahs one was a suffering servant from isaiah 53 and the other was a conquering hero who was going to come and and uh, uh take over and have a kingdom well judas was convinced that jesus was going to use his power which he had seen in action to become the king to, to oust the romans well jesus comes into the triumphal entry and they try to make him king hosanna hosanna right and he leaves he just walks off and judas is like whoa what 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 happened this is it and he was upset and i kind of think this is just me thinking i kind of think that judas was like i'll force his hand if i sell him out he'll have to show his power because when he gets arrested he will have to then show that he's god and then he will do what he's supposed to do well that's not what happened and that's why judas had so much guilt throws the, the, the 30 pieces of silver back and hangs himself because he was trying to force god's hand to do what he wanted done instead of following god's plan do you see how all this is self-sabotage now here's the good part i'm gonna take a little drink here and then i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna work you over okay so get your piece, piece of paper ready you ready mm, so good all right my questions to you have you ever known exactly what you're supposed to do not done it and self-sabotage something you wanted I had a guy when I was asking him this on uh, Tuesday night he says do I get points for all of them because <laughs> he says I've done all of them second one has God ever told you through the Holy Spirit or otherwise to do something and you didn't believe him he was gonna go give you a blessing somehow or that you were to trust him in provision or that you were to um, you know follow his direction somewhere and you didn't do it did 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 somehow or another did did, did you did you did you self-sabotage something because of that how about this have you ever made an emotional decision that undercut something you wanted I this is a big one that that really uh, um, really gets people because we've all made dumb emotional decisions and, and and I always tell people if, if you ever if you ever make an emotional decision did it ever work out and most of the time it's no I mean either you're too happy and you're making emotional decisions and you're not thinking clearly or you're mad and then you do dumb stuff or you're sad and you make decisions you shouldn't have made um, etc cetera, etc cetera. how about this one um, <laughs> uh, have you ever wanted to be like the culture have you ever said, you know, I, I, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, but but I, I'm going to be like the culture. And you and and you sabotaged something. You sabotaged maybe uh, part of your faith. You sat, you know, you compromised. Um, you, you, and and you and God took a blessing from you because of it. Right? Self sabotage. Have have you have you ever? Uh, you know, I was telling a story about a uh, you know, job interview. Sometimes you'll be in a job interview and you'll think, you know, I got, you know, I'm, I'm doing really well, and and then you think, gosh, I, I, you start to question, and then you and then you say something really stupid, you know, you make a joke that you shouldn't make, or because you self sabotage yourself, you didn't really think you were worthy of it. How about this one? Um, have you ever gotten outside of your lane and done something that wasn't yours to do? And that's a self sabotage because you know you're always going to pay for that one, right? That that that's a self sabotage. You know, I mean, the, the thing about self sabotage, you know, not to do these things, but you do them anyway. And you do them. How does that tie in with negative self talk? You do them because your negative feelings about yourself move you into these bump, bad decisions. How you think is how you are. 
and you self sabotage when you're thinking you're not worthy, when you're not lovable, when you're not what you know, put your your flavor, whatever it is, you're stupid, whatever it is, you'll start making decisions that sabotage your blessings, your opportunities, your gifts, all of it. Have you been somebody's wasted your life? See, I, I have a lot of friends that are nominal Christians. We call nominal Christians. They they maybe were maybe they were baptized, but they've really never followed the faith. They don't know anything about the Bible. They don't read it. Maybe they pray, uh, but they're they go to they go to Christmas and Easter, and that's about it. They really don't know Jesus, and they've self sabotaged themselves not just for blessings and God's hand in their life and all the rest. Who knows about their salvation? How about uh, um, taking bad advice, listening to the wrong people? Scripture says plans fail for lack of counsel. Uh, plans fail for lack, of, for, for, for lack of good counsel. Plans fail when there's bad counsel. And you, you know, Scripture says uh, uh, bad company corrupts good character. And sometimes you're around the wrong people. And you're not smart enough to get out from underneath them, no matter what anybody tells you. And you know that they're bad counsel, but you listen to them anyway. And every time you're with them, you get in trouble. And you're self-sabotaging yourself because, you know, you just, for whatever reason in your head, you can't break that relationship which God has told you to break. I'm thinking of a guy right now. Um, you ever lie? To, to, you know, the Holy Spirit? Tell God you're going to do something and not do it? Oh, don't do that. That's a bad one. That's really sabotaging yourself. Now, you can get forgiveness, of course, but it ain't, it ain't smart to lie to God. It's not like you're fooling him, right? And the other one is trying to force God's hand. Have you ever been in a position where you're trying to force God's hand? There's something you want, and you're trying to force God to make you know, like you some kind of vending machine you put in a quarter and you get a candy bar. That's not how God works. And I'm thinking of another guy right now. God is, is is not your personal valet. You are the created being. He is God and not the other way around. You will not force his hand. You will not, you know, you are to line up with his plan, not the other way around. And if things aren't going your way, right, chances are good you're not lined up with God and you're trying to get him to line up with you. And you will self-sabotage yourself because all you will know is, is wonder why God's not blessing you. And you'll never look to yourself to see that it's you. You'll always blame somebody else. You'll actually, you'll always blame God. Right? So in all of these things, we undercut God's blessings. We undercut the gifts he has for us. We undercut our ability to serve and glorify God. We undercut our ability to bring heaven as it uh, is on earth. Uh, uh, we, we undercut this whole Christian walk. You know, we have a witness. People are watching us. We undercut our walk. We undercut our witness when we do things that self-sabotage. Now, the self-sabotage comes from our brains. It comes from the negative self-talk, right? It comes from not really believing or not really understanding who you are in Christ or not really uh, embracing the, the, the beauty of the faith and the discipline of it, right? There, there's, there's all sorts of pieces of this thing. And, and so when you're dealing with negative self-talk, it will express itself in self-sabotage. I, I, man, I'm, I'm thinking about a half a dozen different people are coming to my mind right now that are doing this at this very moment. I, I mean, people I'm working with and, and, and know as friends that are self-sabotaging themselves because of something in their head where whatever's going on there. I don't want to get into too many details. They may be watching. You never know. Um, so I just want to I just want to let you know that that we all got to work on this. You know the Christian faith is not a one and done. It's not say the sinner's prayer and you you know it's all done. It's a lifetime journey. It is work every single day. And thank goodness God's mercies are new every morning, so that we can recover and every day start afresh. 
And I'm here to tell you, I need to work on my negative self-talk. I, I am, uh, and it's hard because I think I deserve some of the harsh criticism I give myself. And I'm, I gotta try to break that somehow. And I'm, I'm not quite sure um, how long that's gonna take, but it's something I need to work on. Uh, and I think you do too, or I wouldn't be preaching on it. And I think that you can see from scriptural uh, pieces, from, from the various people that we've pointed out, uh, how that has played itself out. How you think is what you are. What you are and what you think is how you'll act. And how you'll act will end up self-sabotaging yourself if all you think is negative. I don't think that's rocket science. I think there's a, a pretty logical progression there. So uh, I'm going to finish up tonight and uh, just tell you, uh, here's the exercise. Write down expectations you have. Determine whether they are reasonable or unreasonable. If they are reasonable, talk about how you're going to meet them, even if you got to stair-step them. If they're unreasonable, adjust fire and make them reasonable and talk about how you're going to stair-step to get them. So you have a, a better sense of reality of what you're capable of and at, at, at what points you're going to stair step and, and be able to benchmark those things to get to where you want to get to then see if the negative self-talk dies down a little bit but also then look at how you self-sabotage yourself in the past and currently are you doing things now because of your faulty thinking that are causing you to make faulty decisions based upon any of the different things I said, whether it's emotions or getting out of your lane or, or not believing God's promises or you know whatever it might be. And if you do those things, do it on paper so you can actually see it. If you do those things, you're going to be able to then recognize areas that you can put some work in. Now, work starts with prayer. Ask Jesus to help you through the Holy Spirit to correct this, right? And we're gonna be working on this together. And I'll pray for you, you pray for me. And we'll see that if we can if we can get better at this. Because um, the enemy does take advantage of us. He does watch us. He does see where we get frustrated and upset with ourselves. He does see where we don't meet our expectations. And that whisper campaign he has is very, very powerful because what he says coincides with what we already believe. And it just reinforces it. So we've got to... We've got to be stronger in our disciplines on this stuff. So I hope this has been interesting. And uh, I will be back one way or the other. I'll be back on the 21st, on Sunday the 21st, um, because we're either going to be at Samanka or I'll be right here uh, doing a Samanka Live. So I will catch you. Have a great weekend. And we will see you in a week.